call me Bucky Mook. Lucky that I'm innocent. Uh, if I didn't have no morals, I'd be menacing. Uh, how about hey everyone? Welcome back to Soul Therapy. Today I have a really cool guest, Thor of AFL, big sneakerhead, as you can see, Harry Himmelberg. Great to have you, bro. Thanks for having me. Everyone must be thinking, how did you get started in the AFL? I, I know your story, but I'd love for you to let our guests know. I thought it was a really funny story. So, yeah, how did you get started? Yeah, I, so I grew up in Wagga Wagga, country New South Wales. Mm -hmm. In Wagga, there's not a whole lot to do. About 80,000 people, pretty small town. The town revolves around sport, and mum played high level basketball, dad, not so much, but he was into basketball. So She was in a college team. Yeah, right? yeah, she was, yeah. So from a young age, I was subjected to sport, and, and athletes used to go watch dad play, used to go watch mum play. So And I was probably blessed a little bit. I got some good genes. Mum and dad are both very tall. I grew up playing sport, all, all, all different sports, literally did everything that was available mainly to get out of school if I could. Yeah, when I was growing up, AFL wasn't huge in Wagga. Mm -hmm. um, it was more so rugby league, basketball. I played basketball until I was about 16. I was tiny when I was little, so rugby league naturally was starting to hurt too much for me. <laughs> I was getting I was getting smashed every weekend. And my skills and, and that sort of stuff probably more transferred to AFL. And a few of my mm -hmm. mates started playing AFL when I was about 14. So I went down and got into that. By the time I was 17, it was that was when I sort of had to make a decision what I wanted to, to go down. I knew that being an athlete was probably my best bet of, of a job. So <laughs> so I went down that, that AFL path and the Giants started their academy when I was about 15. So I was in the GWS Academy, which was really cool and it really fast tracked me and got me to a stage where I was, yeah, able to get drafted to the Giants, albeit as a 19 year old, took me one year longer. Mm. Um, but the academy was really the, the, the starting piece for me to, to get to that standard pretty quickly. Being from Wog, obviously AFL is quite a Victorian Based sport, so it's, it's yeah. a bit harder. But yeah, that was that was the stepping stone for me. When did you know that you could actually be you know, one of the top players in, in AFL? When I was 18, I was I was good, but I was still physically not there. I was a little bit smaller. I probably didn't have the work rate that was required to, to play at, at the top level. You're not exposed, not being in Victoria, to the best players as much. Mm -hmm. And when I went to play for New South Wales when I was 18, that was when I was like, these guys are a lot better than, yeah. than I am. And I didn't get drafted when I was 18, which is the usual draft age. And I ended up breaking my jaw that year. Oh, no. um, so I missed about eight weeks with that. Came back, lost about seven kilos through that. Just, you can't eat, obviously. <laughs> um, I was just nowhere near it. Got a trade, moved to Canberra. Mm -hmm my parents moved to Brisbane and then that year when I turned 19 was sort of just clicked for me I was like you got two paths I say it like you can keep doing carpentry or and go down this sort of road or you can sort of really put all your eggs in one basket and try and play AFL which is what I really wanted to do by that stage and I had a really good year when I was 19 they I was lucky enough for New South Wales to let me play as an overager because I missed the big block of my 18th year with my with my jaw and then I really sort of went from strength to strength that year and ended up getting drafted pick 16 in the first round yeah. um, of the national draft which was something that if you told me that the year before I would have told you F crazy like <laughs> it was just such a fast progression as you progress you just you have to have this sort of inner belief and it's hard for a lot of young kids that come in and all different personalities some people are more confident than others I was fortunate enough to just be pretty confident in my ability and yeah, that definitely helped. How did the first game feel? You know, your first ever AFL game after being drafted 16. Yeah. And you know, the first kind of steps on, on the pitch. I was really fortunate to come into a team that was flying. We were winning games by a lot. I came in against Brisbane Lions who at the time weren't going as well and we had a, a huge win and I played pretty well in my first game. Yeah. Um, my first year I only played four games of AFL at the top level, but like I said, to come into that environment where the team's thriving really helped because when you have your peaks and troughs as a team, it just gives you that understanding of what it feels like when the team is flying and how to get back to there and that feeling. I was really fortunate that we had some really good players, Joel Patful, Phil Davis, guys like that, that were able to mentor me. What did you learn from them? AFL was a funny one because it's like a 360 degree sport. So a lot of positioning stuff, a lot of like off field stuff as well, like yep. not even to do with footy, like how to look after your body, mm. how to switch off from footy, I think is a big one. Do things that you're passionate about, sneakers, cars, fashion, all this sort of stuff to take your mind off it. And then also um, just how to get the best out of yourself and, and others. I guess fast forwarding a bit, you know, you're at the, you're, I think you're still at the height of your career now. What are some highlights that you've had in your career that you look back and you're like, I can't believe I achieved that. Was it the you know, 22 in, in 22 or? Oh, I think playing in the grand finals 
the pinnacle for me thus far. Obviously, we didn't get the result that we wanted in 2019, but making it to the grand final in that year was something that was, you sort of dream about it when you, you want to play AFL to win and you want yeah. it to play any sport to win championships or to win premierships. One was like a huge achievement for me and some of my best mates, but also it's created like such a drive for me to get back there now because we weren't able to to win that. All I want is to get back there. So that's really been like a huge motivator for me is that feeling, I want to feel that again and I want to feel what it's like to win. Yeah, what do you think is your edge? Like what do you think differentiates you from, from other players? Oh, I think we spoke about it a little bit before. When I was playing basketball and rugby, I was really small yeah. growing up. I think I, I saw my under 16s bio a couple months ago and I was 169 centimeters wow. and um, 74 kilos or something, I think it was. Yeah, wow. Um, so, Fast forward now, I'm 195, 95 kilos. It's a completely different body shape and stuff, but the skills that I got when I was that small and essentially avoiding getting smashed, I think transferred a little bit to what I am now. I had really good spatial awareness. My agility was really good and I, I maintained that through like my growth spurt and putting on a little bit of size. So that's probably my differential point nowadays is my agility for my size is really good and like I mentioned before like just really athletic and I think as I've gotten on I've learned how to really get the best out of my body and work hard you probably know a guy named Toby Green he, he's been huge for me in my career he's one of the hardest workers I've ever met at training at training he'll rip your head off even if you're his teammate he, he doesn't differentiate his training from his game day in output which is like what the best players do you hear like Michael Jordan you hear of all these athletes, the, the similarity between all of them is that they train really hard. Intensity at 100 yeah, all the time. Yeah, Kobe, these sort of guys. That's probably been the, the main differentiation for me is those sort of attributes, but then pairing them with working hard and getting the best out of your body as far as fitness and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, speaking about sneakers as, as one of your hobbies, how did you get into sneakers? You're, you're, I think you're the poster child of, of sneaker heads in the AFL. I don't think there's anyone that has a bigger collection than you. That's my, my there's, view there. There's a few. <laughs> Christian Petrarca from the D's, he's got some serious some serious heat in the Nike mm -hmm. department. I love Nike as well. Like, Do you remember what your first pair was? They were, they were pretty <laughs> They were like um, They were like a suede Air Force One, mm -hmm. but they were like pink with a gum sole. <laughs> and I thought, you get those? I thought that was sick at the time. <laughs> they were like this salmon suede. I thought that was so cool. But then I always just kept finding myself buying like Air Force Ones mm -hmm. over the journey. Like I've got lots of shoes now, but like I bought the CLB. Yeah, um, the Drake ones. Air Force Ones the other day, just plain white, like that sort of premium leather and a little bit of detailing on the sole. The, the love hearts. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember your first pair of Jordans? I think these are my first pair of Jordans. Well, wow, yeah. Yeah, which is pretty crazy, but actually no. I, I had some, <laughs> these are shit too. <laughs> I had some fly knit bread Jordans. Yeah. When they did the fly knit. I thought they were pretty cool. To be, to oh, be I thought frank, they were cool. I thought they were pretty cool. I still think they're pretty cool, yeah. Ah, oh, I just, I, I love the breads. But they were always like so expensive and I was like, no, I can't afford them. And then they came out with the fly knit and I actually got them at a store for retail yeah, well. in, um, in Sydney. So things like Foot Locker or something maybe. But those are my first ones. These are my second ones because I sold the breads pretty quickly. They kept getting like, because it was fly the knit. Right? They just, they, yeah. were, they were fuzzy. <laughs> um, I'm like really into music and stuff as well. I love like rap music and um, but Travis Scott's one of my favorite. The way that he sort of goes about his sort of fashion and that sort of stuff, I find really cool. And like as soon as I saw these with the backwards swoosh, mm -hmm. I was like, that's it. And yeah. the colorways, like I'm really like a neutral person. I wear a lot of black and earthy sort of tones as well. I just thought these were the coolest shoes I'd ever seen. So I bought them like straight away. Are they still your favorite pair? These are my favorite pair of shoes, but I do have a pair of off-white Air Force Ones. Yeah. The first drop, the first of the 10. Yeah. My claim to fame with those is that they're still mint. Like I keep them in an airtight box. So then there's no yellowing. Wow, they're still okay. all clear. The plastic's all clear. I've worn them twice out of the house, I think. Do you wear them special cases? Is that? <laughs> I wore them to an NBA game. I was stepped in dog shit. <laughs> and... <laughs> I spent so long. I spent so long cleaning them. Yeah, just during the game. Back to <laughs> no, <laughs> watching the games. I didn't realize till after. Yeah, I took them from Australia to America yeah. in a shoebox. 
just so they didn't get creased or anything with like the, the shoe trees and stuff in there. I know you have a big collection now. Is there anything that you're looking to get? Or are you stopping or? I've settled right down on the <laughs> sneaker front just because I've got so many pairs and uh, my girlfriend's really into her fashion and stuff as well. She's got probably more shoes than me. Well, not, okay. not sneakers, but more so like heels and all that sort of stuff. So our wardrobe's pretty full. I was gonna turn our spare bedroom in our house into sort of a sneaker room slash my clothes because I get no wardrobe space. She yeah. takes up three quarters. I actually built a walk-in wardrobe in our the house. The carpentry days, right? Yeah, <laughs> I actually built a walk-in wardrobe because our wardrobe, our walk-in wardrobe was too small. So I had wow. to take out a wall and um, and now our laundry is this wide. Um, <laughs> so the only other shoe that I really, really want is probably getting a bit on the expensive side now is the reverse mockers though. They're, they're really cool. I've got the fragment lows. But the reverse mockers are really cool. I love like suede as well. Yeah. You know, when it comes to fashion, like you know, you're wearing Palm Angels. Like, what are some brands like, that you you generally like and you know, yeah. why? Again, I've probably shifted more to like the blanks sort of stuff. One of my best mates, Tim Taranto, we spent a lot of time together and we probably egged each other on too much with <laughs> like fashion and shoes and stuff. So we went to America and spent about five weeks in America together and like LA, New York, these places, they just have so much cool stuff and fear of God. Like, yeah. even the essentials line's pretty cool. Like it's a bit more affordable, basic sort of stuff. Like cargo pants and stuff are starting to come in now, which yeah. I think is pretty cool. Like baggy cargo pants, like old ripped denim. Um, From the 90s. Yeah, I got into it. I bought a sewing machine at our old place and wow. um, whipped up a little bit of a crew neck for one of my friends, like with some fabric and stuff. And that's something that I'm pretty interested in as well, is maybe looking towards doing some more custom sort of stuff, like um, one of one. Would you um, custom your sneakers? <laughs> that's a tough one because you can't use a sewing machine. You have to use like a leather thing and it's just so much more technical. And I feel like- You want to ruin with, them too. With clothing, yeah, exactly. With clothing, you can make mistakes and sort of, it, you can't really tell, but shoes are like a bit more in your face. But yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Like Shoe Surgeon, I love that page. Yeah. He's awesome. I painted a few of my boots at one stage with like Posca pens and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, I love like custom stuff like that for sure. You're at the peak of your career right now. You know, there's a lot of years left to run away for you. What are your plans kind of moving forward? Is it to, to win a championship or what's what's next? Winning a premiership, I think, is the, the main goal. I know most people would say that that are in sport, but that's why I play. Now that you look back on it when you're a bit older, you realize how much time and effort, like mum and dad, because we were in Wagga, mum and dad used to drive me to Sydney, Canberra, these places wow. pretty much every weekend so I could play at a higher level or um, play in representative teams and stuff. So, and they come to most of my games now. So I think part of me is making them proud. I don't know they're proud, but making them realize that all their hard work and the, pretty much the time they gave up for me and my brother, who's also in the AFL was worth it. And seeing how happy they were when we made the grand final and myself um, was, was something special. And I really want to get back to there and, and win that. And then once you get one, I think you just get addicted to it and you you want to win a couple. So I think we can, we can check in in a couple of years, but hopefully there's a few premierships under the belt for sure. Yeah, awesome. I'm sure there's a lot of younger Harrys out there that are looking to you know, play sports professionally or, or build a career and, and you know, really start their lives, right? What advice would you have for them? I think looking back on it now when I was, when I was coming through, the main thing for, for me is I love playing the game, but it's more so the fact that the people that I met, like yep. I'm, still, I'm still really close with people that I played on the 16s with and the friendships that you build in a team sport. And I'll, I'll sit in a pub in 30 years with guys that I played football with. Um, and that's like really special to me is, is creating those sort of bonds and don't take it for granted when you're young. Have, having fun's the main, main objective. Don't get too caught up, I'd say, in making sure you do this and do that and get drafted. Like that's all important and it's all, it, it comes if, if you work hard and if you put your head down and you believe in it. I think belief is the main one. You, you see people come into the AFL that are super talented, but their belief isn't there and you don't believe that you belong. And quite quickly, it, it takes hold of you. And if you don't believe in yourself, then how is someone else supposed to believe in you sort of thing? So I think if you sort of back yourself and take risks and, and really enjoy the moment um, and take every moment as it comes, that's the main one for me. I've got like regrets from when I was younger. Um, that I didn't do this or do that, but it sort of shaped my pathway. And now I look back on it and say, oh, it actually wasn't. Um, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I was having fun at the time and that was the main reason that kept me playing. Yeah, was there anything that you struggled with in your career? Was it you know, either 
not having enough fun or you're know, not seeing you know being able to have time to spend with people you care about like was there anything that, that you kind of faced oh, I think life as a professional athlete you you have to sacrifice a lot I missed every single one of my best mates 21st birthdays well wow. that sort of stuff yeah. you miss weddings you miss this sort of stuff your weekends during the season you can't go out with your mates as much as you'd like to or partners like my partners she spends her weekends um, at the footy um, she'd probably like to be doing other things that's when it really gets hard to to front up every day but i think in a team sport the beauty of it is you've got well we've got 44 blokes on the list so 43 other guys are the exact same and you come in and everyone's in it together so and the other thing is like you i've got two two dogs and my girlfriend so I come home at the end of the day, they don't care if we want footy or not. The dogs certainly don't. So that's something that I sort of always fall back to as well when it, when it is hard, when we're losing games or my f personal form's not as good as I want it to be. That's what I like to sort of fall back on and just be grateful for those sort of things. The interesting thing about being a professional athlete is that you have to dedicate your life to, to your craft, which is your know, AFL for you. What's your daily routine like? Is it different from, from other people's? How, how do you think through? Is, what, what's your diet like, like to, to stay so lean and, and, and fit? How do you spend a typical day in your job? Yeah, uh, like I mentioned before, I think your week for us is not the same as last week. We play on different days, so we could play any day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Pre-seasons where you have a little bit more structure. It differentiates between clubs as well, but traditionally for us, it would be Monday, full day. Mm -hmm. So we do a big session on the field, come off, quick lunch, into weights, afternoon rotation. So we'd have weights, Pilates, you do vision if you if you wanted to. You do recovery. We've got recovery facilities, so ice baths, mm. heat, all this sort of stuff, getting your body right for the next day. Tuesday would be like a half day in preseason, so we come in, maybe cross train, um, off legs, low impact stuff, meetings, that sort of stuff again. Wednesday, same as Monday, full day of rotations and stuff. Thursday day off, and then Friday another full day. So we'd have three main big full footy sessions um, during the week, where that's where you do all your implementing of your meetings and your game plan and stuff into training at full noise. So we do anywhere between 40, 45 Ks in a pre-season week wow. on track running. Uh, wow. And that's high speed running as well. A lot of our pre-season this year, especially the way that we want to play has been high speed. Yeah, wow. um, So that's an adjustment when you do a lot of high speed running, you get quite sore after. So recovery is a big one as well for us. So a pre-season day would be in at seven o'clock, went through the day and then um, your recovery and stuff in the afternoon, but then after that, your diet and stuff becomes really important as well. Um, as everyone sort of says, as an athlete, you have to make sure you're getting in. We'd be, we'd be burning so many calories during those main days. For me personally, it's hard because I'm, I'm not a big eater, naturally. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the, way, the position that I play, I sort of have to keep the weight on as yeah. well. So for me, it's sort of finding a way to um, get consistent food in throughout the day. So having s small snacks, tuna, this sort of stuff, like where you got to get the protein in so you can recover and ultimately be able to do that big 12K session again on in two days. Yeah, well. Um, yeah, the, the main meals are quite important as well. Breakfast, use it, like I'll usually have eggs, um, eggs on toast or something in the morning and then pretty blessed we get provided lunch in pre-season on main days. The footy club, there's a cafe there that's run by a chef, so well. he um, he puts on a spread. It differentiates every day, which is good. It's refreshing. It's usually some sort of main protein, rice, um, mm -hmm. pita breads, that sort of stuff. Salad, and then um, at night, I'm really lucky. My girlfriend's an amazing cook, so she's on most nights, um, but I have my little cameos every now and then. I'm yeah. pretty good on the barbecue. I can I can make stir fries and basic sort of stuff, but she's the she's the um, star in the kitchen um, in our house, which is really really handy, and that's just one one less thing that I sort of have to worry about. So I try and pick up the slack a little bit with with the dogs and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And last question: What's something that you're you're looking to improve on about yourself? Oh, that's a tough one. I think bit just, of a curveball. Yeah, <laughs> I've sort of played eight years now and in the AFL and you get to a stage where you're playing quite consistently, your body's in a good space. I've been really lucky with injuries that I haven't been had long-term injuries, touch wood and stuff like that. So I think finding the small incremental gains is the hardest part. I found it quite easy and motivating to sort of 
right, oh, I've got to put on five kilos of muscle, I've got to do this, I've got to get faster, I've got to know the game plan perfectly, that sort of stuff. But then as you sort of get into your peak or your, the back end of your career, that's when you sort of start to incorporate things like leadership. That's something that I'm really working hard on at the moment is mm -hmm. that there's guys in our team that were born in 2000 and 2001 <laughs> now and 2002, yeah. so. Different generation. For yeah, us. exactly. So finding a way to be who I spoke about before to them, mm. um, for me is, is really important and being able to be a good role model for other players and then ultimately for my family when I have kids is something that, yeah, I'm sort of passionate about and, and being a good leader and role model. So working in that space is, is like, it's different to me because your first six years, you'll all you want to do is be the best player yeah. you can be and you want to play AFL and play every single game of the year. Um, but now it's about that generation coming up to the level of all the older players, that's how you win. I think that sort of carries into your life after football as well. I'm studying business at uni, so yeah, whether it ends up in an office or um, <laughs> something sort of outside of that, that f carries over to your life after football as well. Yeah, no, exactly. Thanks for coming in, Harry. I think that was a really insightful um, chat. I think yeah. not many people know what it's like to be a professional athlete and you're know, having to do what you do, but also it's really cool that you're that you're thinking about you know things that I'm sure people at home are thinking about right just more how do I be you know the best version of myself that I can be mm. so that's really cool um you know it's always a pleasure to have you in and you yeah. know I hope to see you in a premiership soon yeah that's the that's the goal so yeah, for sure um and hopefully we can you know meet each other do, do the next one in front of our dream class yeah exactly <laughs> we'll just um fresh up on the bottom yeah, exactly. Cool them. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> nah, thanks, thanks for coming. Me. That was awesome. Call me Bucky New. Lucky that I'm innocent. Uh, if I didn't have no morals, I'd be menacing. Uh, how about this rapping conscious, but he ignorant? Uh, how you find the hood, but still gon' go legitimate? Uh, how you fuck a bunch of b but they still respect the women? He's the rolling, it's another. He just got the windows tinted. Homie stab me in the back, and that can never be forgiven. And my pines been itching, man. I like your superstition. Mm -mm. Phone number, let's be running up the digits. Let me matter.